Alright, it is 3 o'clock. I got the recorder started. And we are going to get started on a really kind of interesting module. Okay, we're going to talk about Aleph Null today. And um, it's a very interesting topic. Okay, so that's all I can say for now. Okay, we'll find out how interesting it is. Yeah, obviously, yeah, whether something is interesting or how interesting it is is very subjective. But I'm starting up um, Joplin because you know, there are certain things I need uh, Joplin to help with because of the notations and all the special symbols. So we'll go ahead and continue with another root here. Hi, these two panels. Today is 2024, 9-18. Okay, so we'll start with a few things, okay? We'll start with a question of, you know, whether a set is a subset of another set, okay? So this is my question, okay? So the question is, okay, insert. The question is, um, math pd n subset pq math pd c there we go okay so can someone tell me whether this is true or not okay so obviously right away okay we got notation things that you should know already okay and if you do not I suggest you to read a little bit more, okay? Review the material that we have talked about so far because, you know, every single symbol here has been introduced already. All right, so let's let's start with uh, the funny looking N. What, what is it? What is it representing? The set of all natural numbers, very good. So the next question, which is also, which is a trick question, okay? Is whether that set includes zero or not? Is zero a natural number? <laughs> it depends on where you go to school, okay? <laughs> uh, in my case, you know, zero is a natural number, um, and then counting numbers exclude zero, okay? So there's the set of counting numbers which starts with one, and then there's the, the set of natural number which starts with zero. So for the purposes of this class, Okay, the set of natural numbers does include zero. Okay, so that's the first thing. The next thing is, what is this funny looking Z? The set of all integers, very good. Okay, so now we have the set of all natural numbers and then we have the set of all, all in integers. What is this symbol in between? It is relating the two sets, but what is it trying to say? Subset of, exactly. So the question is, is this true or not? Because I'm not claiming that nat the set of natural number is in fact a subset of the set of all <coughs> integers. I'm simply asking, is it? What do you think? Okay, this is true. Okay, it is true because every natural number is also an integer. Okay, all right, so next question. Almost the same, except I changed that to a subset EQ into a subset which means on the right-hand side, it is now asking whether the set of natural number is a proper subset of the set of all integers. What do you think? It is also true because negative one is an integer and yet it is not a natural number. Any way you look at natural number, it does not include negative values, okay? So it's all like, okay. So now I ask you another question, okay? This one would take a little bit longer to answer so this time I'm asking you this question. I'm putting the cardinality symbol here and then put it equal here and then also cardinality on the other side. And I put a question mark here because that's kind of the question that we want to answer today. I'm looking at the cardinality of the set of all natural numbers. I'm looking at the cardinality of the set of all integers and I ask, are they the same? Hmm, yes, okay, I can see a few people read the module ahead of time or already understood the concept of your olive note from somewhere else, okay, but the answer is yes, okay, 
but we want to know, but why? It does not make sense, okay? Because at first glance, it does not make sense because the set of all natural numbers is in fact a proper subset of the set of all integers, which means, quote unquote, okay, I have to put quotes, air quotes around it, which means the set of all integers has more things than there, and than there are in the set of natural numbers. That is actually true, okay, because I can point out individual items and go like, look at negative four. It is a member of the set of integers, but it is not a member of the set of natural numbers. So given that is the case, how can their cardinality to be the same? So that's the very same question we're gonna to answer today. Is that okay? So I just wanted to set this up, you know, as a mystery, okay? Because you know, my, my son took this class <laughs> and he came home and go like, this doesn't make sense, okay? You know, because on one hand, one is the proper subset of the other one. And then on the other hand, we claim that the cardinality are exactly the same, okay? So it is not intuitive to look at this equality here and go like, yep, they are the same. All right, so what we'll do next is to ask the question of, so here's another question, okay? Can we find, I'm gonna call this f, okay? f, which is a function, okay? It is using the set of nat, uh, integers and is mapping that to the set of natural numbers. Such that, okay? So there are some, there's one extra requirement, such that f is, okay, f is a bijective. Okay, so I'm looking for a function, okay? It can be funny looking, it can be weird, okay? But nonetheless, you know, I just need a function where it is a bijection between, you know, using uh, the set of integers as the domain and using the set of all natural number as the codomain. Okay, so that's, that's the question. So if you have read the notes ahead of time, the answer is clearly, yep, okay? And even if you cannot remember the details, okay? After you read the notes, the first thing you, prob you probably will rem remember is, yep, yep, somewhere along the notes, you know, it mentions you know, such a function does exist. So this is why it is important to read the material ahead of time, because even if you don't get all the details, you're getting the general idea that, and the concepts is actually important in a class like this. Okay, so the answer is yes. Okay, so we'll go ahead and Answer that question first, okay, yes. And now the next question is, but what does it look like? Ooh, I cannot type. Ah, there we go. All right. So instead of me typing everything here, I'm just gonna refer back to my notes, okay? You know, because uh, if I can save a few typing, you know, keystrokes, I'm gonna do that. There's no reason for me not to do that. Okay, so we'll go ahead and I'm still trying to get used to my keyboard. And you guys go like, how, how hard can it be to get used to a keyboard? It's mostly the touchpad because this touchpad does not actually have buttons for the left and the right click. So I have to find out exactly where I need to click it you know, to register as a regular click versus a right click. All right, so it's the little things that get me. All right, so this is the function. So if you have not been reading the notes or the reading material ahead of time, despite my recommendation on Monday, you might want to consider doing that more often, okay? All right, so looking at this function, are you convinced that this is indeed a function? In other words, it will map every integer to one and only one natural number. Are you convinced? So we'll, we'll plug in a few numbers, okay? We'll say, what if x is negative five? Okay, so what, what comes out on the other end of this function? If x is negative five, what's gonna happen? Negative five is greater than or equal to zero, it's false. Then what do we do? We take the thing. Exactly, very good, okay. 
So that it will be what? Negative, negative two times negative five is no, 10, and then 10 minus one is nine. So negative five maps to nine. Okay, what about five, like positive five? So positive five is greater than or equal to zero is true. So it returns two times five, which is a 10. What about one? F of one is two. What about F of negative one? No, I take it back. One is mapped to two. What about negative one? Negative one maps to one. That's right. So the way this works is if you think about the natural number line, which from your perspective, this is zero and it goes in this direction. And then when you look at the um, integers, it goes in both directions. So basically what I'm doing is I am folding the negative side of integers and then stretch it out by twice the length and then flop it onto the natural number side, okay? And therefore, I can map all these negative integers to every other, quote unquote, natural number, you know, on just the num natural number side. Then what about the non-negative integers? Well, they're also stretched, but without flipping onto the other side. So it really helps to work out a few examples, okay? You know, in, because you know, that really helps you understand the concept. So if I want to work out a few examples for this type of function, so can someone give me at least two ways to do this? And it does not involve you know, using, doing this by hand because I don't want you guys to do it by hand. I want you to figure out a way to do it so that it's quick, easy, and you can actually visualize you know, like 20 numbers in a row, okay? Because you know, that's, that's what you need to actually get a, get a feel of this. All right, so what, what two ways do you think is, is good for demonstrating how this function works? I'm gonna ask a really stupid question here. How many people here are computer science students? Okay, and how many of you have taken CISP 360? So what do you think the answer is? Exactly, write a program, use a for loop, write this function, and then just let it print, you know, the, you know, not, uh, uh, go from negative five to positive five, and then print out the F value of, you know, those particular values. Should I demonstrate how to do that? You guys are gonna shake your head, but I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm doing it because you're shaking your head, just because. All right, so this is also a really good resource, by the way. It's called Online GDB. If you do not know what Online GDB is, you might want to kind of get to know it because this is a quick and easy way for you to kind of write your small, small snippets of code, run it. Now, I know Replit can do it, but Replit is starting to charge people, right? It's starting to ask for your money. And also on top, it does not have as good of a debugger as Online GDB. Okay, so for two reasons, Yep. When did Replit start doing this? Did I log have... in and like probably last week I did not use it for the and I saw it and I'm like, that's stupid. <laughs> I have no idea when they started to do it. Um, does anyone know? It was over the summer. Like, over like, the like, summer? Last semester they did that. Okay. So it's sometime, you know, over the summer. I don't use Replit for anything because you know, I'm using Linux, so it's really easy for me to install Node.js or Python or whatever I need to do, I can just install it in the OS. But you know, um, this actually has a really wide selection of languages. So you can actually do Java, you can do Python, you can do R COBOL. Okay, that I did not expect to see. Um, <laughs> Ruby, which is kind of fairly common, Visual Basic, Rust, Go, Bash, so that's actually pretty good. The one thing I don't see is, oh, okay, it does have JavaScript too. So it, it has got just about everything that I really you know, care about. There may be some other programming languages, but you know, most of those I don't really care. All right, so this is a straight up you know, C program. It's not even C++. So I'm gonna modify this program. Can you guys read the text? Because it's 
inverted, you know, that may be difficult, you know, given how the screen gets kind of washed out. Is that okay? All right, okay. So I'm gonna say um, int i, because in C, you cannot declare a variable inside the parentheses of a for loop. In C++, you can. So for i goes from negative five, i is less than or equal to five, because I want that to be the last value, plus plus i, okay, so here to loop. And I also want to make that function, so I might as well just write the function itself. The function is gonna return an unsigned, even though the parameter is a signed, and it's simply going to return exactly what we talked about, okay? It will ask, is x um, greater than or equal to zero? If so, it is just going to return two times x. Otherwise, it returns negative two times x, the whole thing minus one. There we go. And put a semicolon here because you'll, uh, the implicit parentheses are here too. So I'll make this very explicit, okay? This is just two times x. All right, so here's a loop. And because this is regular C, I'm just gonna do a printf. So printf, we can say f of, okay? This is the integer is, and this is the unsigned, and then backslash n you know, for line feed. And then we give it i you know, as the number between the parentheses so that we can apply function f to it. And then we will use you know, f of i as the other value that we print, okay? So are we good so far with the program? Okay, so uh, semicolon at the very end. I keep forgetting this because I, I have gotten lazy you know, because I've been reading, writing code in JavaScript which does not require that last you know, semicolon. Yes, so true to my t-shirt, I'm just lazy. That's all. <laughs> I can afford to be lazy, you cannot. Okay, let me make it very clear. <coughs> All right, so we're gonna run the program, okay? If you want to debug the program, you can click debug and you can set up breakpoints and examine the variables and all kind of good stuff. But I'm fairly sure this program is gonna work, so I'm gonna click run. And huh? Um, I, no, this is in main, I don't have to call it. Hmm? I think it's already in the output. It's just, you know, somehow the text is not visible. Okay, let's try debug. No, I'm not new to debugging the program. Thank you. So I think it's the text color not, not showing up. And I have no idea why that is the case. All right, so let's see. Do we have a configuration to change this? Ah, okay. So instead of struggling with this, I'll do it, okay, copy. And instead of doing this, I'm going to do it in the command line. There's always a fallback, okay? <clears throat> All right, so we'll go ahead and cat to f of x dot c, paste the program. This is the entire program itself, gcc dash g dash o, fx, fx.c, and then run the program, there we go. So you can kind of see how this works, okay? Negative five is mapped to nine, negative four is mapped to seven, so you can see all the odd numbers on the natural number is, is mapped from the negative integers. All the non-negative integers map to even numbers of the natural number line, okay? So this helps you visualize, okay? Because if you just work on one value at a time, you go like, okay, I kind of get one value, right? But this really gives you an idea. This is why I said a little bit earlier, you take the negative side of the integers, stretch it, you know, so it's twice as long, and then you turn it over on the other side, and then you also just kind of stretch the non-negative numbers on the uh, integer side, and you just kind of interleave the odd numbers and the even numbers, and there you have the map. Are we good so far? Okay, so now the next question is, okay, the next question is, um, given this is function f, is it a bijection? So in order to be a bijection, it has to be first an injection, 
it also has to be a surge action, okay? So let's check the first one first. If I give this function a different value, so you know, f of x versus f of y, x does not equal to y, is it guaranteed to give me two different values? Okay, so how, how would you prove that informally? Okay, you know, because we haven't really talked about formal proof. So how would you prove that informally? Okay, let me kind of mention what I mean a little bit here. So I would say if x does not equal to y, then f of x does not equal to f of y. Okay, but how do you prove it? I can see three particular steps, okay? So you can say, you know, x is, uh, one is negative and the other one is not, okay? So one is not negative, the other one is negative. So if that is the case, then you, if you go back to the actual definition, then one is going to be an even number, the other one is going to be an odd number, done. Because an odd number cannot equal to an even number. Okay, so when they, when x and y, one is positive and the other one is not positive, negative, then we have that proof already. What if they're both positive? Well, if x and y are both positive, that means we're looking at two times x versus two times y. If x and y are different, don't you think two times x and two times y would also be different? Okay, done with that. What if they're both negative? And then we're looking at you know, this particular part, and I'm fairly sure that you are convinced that you know, if x and y are different, this part, this expression, will also give you two different values. So there's the very informal way of proving that this is injective. What about surge action? In other words, if I give you a particular natural number, you can always say, yep, I know which integer corresponds to it. So let's try this, okay? I will give you a particular integer, okay? Um, given that f of x is 213, okay, what is x? So how would you solve this problem? And I am going to also include the definition of f here just so that everything is in the same spot. So f of x is, if x is greater than or equal to zero, then we return 2x, otherwise we return negative 2 times x minus 1. Okay, just so that we have a reference of the actual function. So how would you solve this problem? If f of x is known to be 213, how do we go backwards to solve for x? Yes? Say again? Well, sort of. Okay, you can, but before you do the algebra part, you kind of have to figure out that, you know, we get an even number if and only if x is greater than or equal to 1. And if we uh, get an odd number, then we know that x is um, negative. Right, but if we, want, if we know which one it is, then we can but use we, algebra. Yep, so we can use algebra. Basically, we are now saying negative 2 times x minus 1 is 213. I'm not going to work on the algebra because I think you guys can solve this one. So the answer is yes, give me any integer and I can figure out which integer corresponds to it, which indirectly proves that this is surge action. Yes, go ahead. It would be negative 107, that is correct, yep. You can also plug in negative 107 and just ask, you know, is this gonna, is f of x or f of 100 and negative 107 going to return a value of 213? And the answer is yes. Very good. All right. So we have just informally proved that this particular function f is injective and surjective, which means it is bijective. Is that okay? And that is all we need. Okay. So in order to prove whatever set that you have here, that to have the same cardinality as the set of all natural number, all we need is a function that looks like this. It is a bijection you know, to the set of all natural number. Now obviously, since it's a bijection, it doesn't matter 
whether you map the set of natural number to the set that we are interested in or the other way around because if it's a bijection it goes in both directions are we good so far okay all right so because you know we established we just established that the set of integers has the same cardinality as the set of natural numbers and there are actually a whole lot more sets where their cardinality is also the same as the cardinality of natural number because of the same reason. We can find a bijection. So that means, hmm, that may mean that you know, the, the whole idea of the cardinality of the set of natural number is important enough to give it a name. <coughs> and what do you think that name might be? The title of the module, and that is? Aleph, no, very good, okay. So that means this whole thing, okay, is also known as Aleph, no, like that, okay? Is that okay? That is the definition, by the way. It is the definition of Aleph, no. Aleph, Aleph no is just the cardinality of the set of natural numbers. All right, so I'm gonna pause here, okay, because there's a lot of abstract concepts to absorb here. The mechanism of this particular function f is just details, okay? The concept is much more important. So do we have any questions about the equivalency of the cardinality between sets that have an infinite number of elements? Questions? Okay. Yes. It could be any function as long as we output a function as uh, by uh, by Jackie. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So you can flip it around, and you can basically map all the negative numbers to even natural numbers, and map all the non-negative integers to odd numbers. You can flip it around, and it, it will still work. Mm -hmm. How do you determine that that, that is actually a bijection uh, just by knowing the function itself? Or, you, or so, for example, if you're going to do some attack that you're going to just print a function and the number? Or so the argument was verbal. I did not actually write it down. So okay. the, the, the first direction is injection. We know it is injective because if x and y are different, then x, f of x, and f of y would be different. I verbally kind of explain the proof of this part here um, because you know there are like three cases x and y are different one is positive one is negative so because of the way the function is structured one is going to return a even number the other one will return an odd number an even number cannot equal to an odd number they can they simply cannot be the same so then I ask what if they're both positive what if your know, x and y are both positive then we have 2 times x versus 2 times y if x and y are different, then 2 times x is going to be different from 2 times y. And then what if they're both negative? Then we have negative 2x minus 1 versus negative 2y minus 1. But if, if x and y are different, then negative 2 minus 2x minus 1 and minus 2y minus 1 are also guaranteed to be different. That part you can prove by using algebra. So that's how we prove injection. And then for the surjection side, that's why we came up with this example. If, if I just give you a natural number, can you go back and tell me which integer maps to that natural number? And the answer is yes. You can give me any natural number, and I can tell you f of which integer will give me that natural number. In fact, there's a closed form. Okay, So let's go for that closed form, which is also in the notes. But I'm going to repeat it over here. So if I were to define f inverse okay, of x, what is that going to look like? Well, it looks like you know, whether it's even or odd is going to be a good question to ask, right? So we first ask the question, which is you know, whether x mod 2 equals to 0 or not. If it is equal to 0, that means you know, we just need to divide it by 2. So the answer is going to be x over 2. Otherwise, you know, we need to, okay, let me 
finish this first, okay? So um, if x mod 2 is in fact 0, then here we have this x unit given, which means we are looking at a um, positive integer. So I did a little typo here. I forgot to use curly braces to enclose negative one, and that's why it's only putting the minus in the superscript. So that way, this way, it looks like this is the way it's supposed to be. All right. So now the question is, uh, what if uh, x mod 2 does not equal to 1? It's an even, it's a, what if x mod 2 does not equal to 0? Okay, which means x is an odd number. If x is an odd, odd number, then we have to reverse this operation. The way we reverse that operation is to apply the inverse in the reverse order, okay? So in this case, the minus one is the very last operation that we perform, so it becomes the first operation which, that we perform when we try to find the reverse. So now we have to do x plus one first, you know, to counter the minus one, and then the multiplication by negative two is the first operation that we have to perform, so this becomes the last operation that we have to perform in this case, so that means we are looking at a fraction, okay? You know, I mean, whether you look at it as a, sub, a division or a fraction, it's up to you, but basically this is how, oops, uh, I forgot to backslash and turn up the frac. There we go. So that's another way to look at the inverse function. So are we okay so far? All right, so it does have an inverse function. So I'm hoping that this is kind of odd for you already, okay? Because we are looking at a number line, the natural number that starts with zero and extends only one direction, and then we are looking at the number line of integers which goes in both directions. One is clearly a proper subset of the other one, and yet I can have a function like this to basically go like, give me any integer, I can map it to a natural number. Give me any natural number, I can find out which integer is supposed to map to it. Okay, it's called a one-to-one -one correspondence, or otherwise in this class known as a bijection. Are we good? Okay, so now we look at something that's even more weird. Okay, so the more weird one is what if we're looking at a space like this? Okay, so this time I'm looking at. Um, this particular set, okay? So let me express the set here. It is the set of all natural numbers, um, Cartesian product with the set of all natural numbers, okay? So this is the set that I'm concerned about. It is basically um, a two-dimensional space, so to speak, or you can look at these as uh, the coordinates of pixels on the screen, okay? So it doesn't matter whether you consider this corner to be 0, 0, or this corner here to be 0, 0. You know, every pixel on the screen has a coordinate that is a member of the Cartesian product of the natural number and the natural number. Does that make sense? Okay. So now the question that I have is this. Is the cardinality of this quote-unquote two-dimensional space, the same as the cardinality of the set of just the natural numbers? That is the question, okay? Let me emphasize a question here. It, this looks weird, doesn't it? Okay, you know, how can we possibly look at a two-dimensional space, okay, which clearly you know, one row of this entire two-dimensional space contains the set of natural numbers already. Okay, every every row in that, in fact. And somehow, you know, I'm asking, well, can we can we establish a bijection between these two sets? So that's the question. So now the the answer is, um, how does it work? If you have read the notes already. What follows is going to be boring, okay? Because it's just a repetition of what is already written. But I will give you the derivation, okay? So the notes that I have is not really just an answer, because a lot of textbook would just kind of say, "Oh yeah, this is the answer, and we're done with this topic." Nope, not the way I do it. 
So the way I do it is I will actually help you do the derivation. So the way it works is I will paint, basically it's the same as the ordering when people lay tiles in a room. Okay, so you think about this and go like, so how do people lay tiles in a room? So for this to, uh, in order to explain this, I think it's better for me to spreadsheet will work okay. So let me use a spreadsheet instead. And go to my drive. Oh, by the way, the other answer to the earlier question of how do you visualize that function is a spreadsheet. A spreadsheet is extremely useful for this sort of thing because I'll show you, yeah, that's, that's usually what I do. Okay, so let me get, create a new Google Sheets, which is basically just a spreadsheet. <clears throat> so if you were to sign into um, the Los Rios, your website right now, you can actually uh, see this particular document, which I will name 2024-09-18, which is today's date. Okay, so that makes it, that makes it very easy for you to find the spreadsheet that I work on in the particular day. So first, first question first. So the first one is, um, how do we visualize the function that we talked about earlier? So on one column I have i, which is five and then negative four, but instead of doing that, I'm just gonna say this cell is whatever cell in front of me plus one, okay? The reason why I do this is now I can do this trick here. Do, 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 do. Yeah, let's have one more, okay? So now you can start to see the, the power of a spreadsheet because once you express the relationship between a cell and the other cells, you can do a lot of cool stuff, okay? So now we want to evaluate f of i as column b. So there are two ways to proceed to talk about this. I can actually drop to extensions and then write my own function in JavaScript and call that function. That's one way to do it. The other way is feel free to spell out you know, what I need to do using Excel or spreadsheet formulae, which I'm gonna do here because I also think this is gonna be useful to you, okay? At some point in time, it's gonna be useful. So I'm gonna say if this number is greater than or equal to zero, then we want to return two times A2. Otherwise, I want to um, return negative two times A2 um, and then the whole thing minus one. Okay, so first of all, do you see the resemblance between this um, formula in Google Sheets and the function that we were just talking about? The syntax is a little bit different, right? You know, it's instead of using the question mark and the colon, um, we use if as the name of the formula, but we are still giving it a condition to evaluate a value to return if the condition is true, and also a value to return if the condition is false. So it is basically doing exactly the same thing. So this is returning nine, and we go just go boop, like all of these, and you can see, oh, okay, we are getting the same values back. Are we good so far with this? Okay. Now, does that mean I'm gonna ask you guys questions in the exams you know, to see whether you know how to use a spreadsheet or not? No. This is just extra things that I find to be useful for classes like this, okay? You know, to have a way to quickly visualize, okay, uh, if I plug in this value over here, what am I getting, okay? So the nice thing about the spreadsheet is, you know, you can actually see, it, you, know, you can even plot it if you want to, okay? You can plot. All right, so I'm gonna add another sheet here to demonstrate the concept that I want to demonstrate at this point. And it's just being really slow. Okay. Come on. Mm. Yeah, but even with that, you know, it should not be like this. So I'm just gonna refresh. There we go. Much better. Okay. So the way I, okay, so uh, laying tile in a room, okay? So how do you think people lay tile in a room? Even if the room is finite and squarish or rectangular, how do you think people lay tile? 
do you think they lay tile like one row at a time and then the next row and then the next row? Nope, that's not how they do it. <laughs> because if they did it that way, um, things can get crooked and they won't know it until it's too late. So you end up with tiles that are kind of crooked and you go like, you know, it becomes like a curvy thing or it goes like this diverging you know, in, in a line like this. So the way they lay tile is this order, okay? So they will lay one tile at the corner and then they would go for these two, okay? And then they go for three, four, and five. And then they go for uh, six, seven, eight, nine, and so on. Because if you lay tile in this particular order, then you know it is less likely that you end up with crooked you know, lines you know, on the tile. So this is a known trick you know that is used by you know people who lay tile you know in you know, as a as a contractor. Okay. So what does this have anything to do with the question that I'm asking? It will take you a little bit of imagination, okay? Instead of looking at A, B, C, D, E, think of these as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And then over here, instead of C, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, look at these as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. What does that have anything to do with what we just talked about? Exactly. So the location of each cell is a member of the Cartesian product between natural number and natural number. Is that OK? In other words, this is at location 0, 0. This is at location 1, 0. This is at location 2, 0. This is at location 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, and so on. Is that OK? Are we, are we convinced that we are looking at basically the same thing, even though the column name is not a natural number, and even though the row name is starting with a 1, eh, they're kind of like natural numbers. Close enough. Are we convinced? Because if you're not, if you're not convinced, I can actually show you how to name each location using a two tuple. Okay, we want to do that. Okay, you guys are trying to test my my uh, Google Sheet foo. Okay, my kung fu with Google Sheets. And somehow, you know, it's not just refreshing. I'm suspecting the browser needs to be refreshed because you know, it has a new version and it's trying to get me to refresh somewhere in one of the windows. That's okay, we got it. All right, so what I need is to get a row number and a column number and then with each one I have to minus one because you know, the row number starts with one and then the column number actually starts with one too. And then I have to put those in parentheses with a comma in between. Okay, I think we can do that because we have concat <coughs> tenate. There's concat and there's concatenate. The difference is concat can only take two strings and concatenate the two strings. Concatenate, on the other hand, can take any number of strings, which is what I want, because you know, this is much more convenient for what I'm trying to do here. All right, so we will specify the strings. Let's start with an open paren, because you know that's how we begin a two tuple, right? And then we'll go specify the um, column number first. So that means you know, I just get the column. This is this returns the column number of the cell where the formula is. But we have to remember to subtract one, and then we have a comma, and then we have the row number. Okay, so row number. We also have to remember to subtract one because row number otherwise starts with one. And then after that, we can close the parentheses. All right. Looks good. I'll just give you like a bunch. Are we good? Okay. So now the idea is, can I find a way to map each one of these two tuple to an to a natural number, and that particular function has to be a bijection? Okay. So let's hold that thought. 
because I'm going to take Rome. <laughs> this is actually a pretty good point to take Rome, too, because you know, I'll let you guys kind of think about this a little bit, and then we'll continue with that. All right, so the access code is Dragon. I cannot even remember why I chose your know, Dragon to be the access code. Generally, at this time, you know, I would use you know, um, SDF1 as an access code. That's the name of the uh, Super Dimensional Fortress 1 you know, from MacDOS, otherwise known as um, Robotech in the United States. All right, so does anyone need more time for the road taking activity? I see most of you are done already. Okay, so let's continue with the spreadsheet. Okay, so the question now is how are we going to name these things? Okay, so between sheet two and sheet three, okay, but I can't really switch between these two. I'm suspecting the browser you know, needs to be refreshed and it's just interfering with what I'm doing here. So let me go ahead and kill the browser first, and then we'll kind of redo the whole thing. Okay, so I gotta, this is not a single command thing to do it, but I can go to here. I have a command called Firefoxes, because at any particular time, I have like several instances. So I can kill one of them, the one that is you know, labeled tech at work, which has this particular process ID, I can I think I have to type this one two three nine three three one. All right, so that killed the the process, and I need to restart it from here. There we go. All right, it's restarting. Give it some time. That's from a different class. So I can probably move this thing out of the way. And yep, this is the one that we are in. And the spreadsheet is So let me go get the spreadsheet. This is this one. There we go. See how well, how much better it's working? Because I think it was actually trying to update the you know, Firefox before, and it's just refusing to do the thing. This has happened in the past, so that's why I recognize. All right, so we're going to name, you know, okay, what, what do you think is the number corresponding to this one? 10, that's right. Okay, so let me do something first. Okay, I'm going to, um, oh, okay, I need to do a shift click here. Oh, click, click, shift, click. Because I want to change the width of each column so it's easier to read. Okay, that makes it easier to read. So this is going to be 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and so on. Okay. So are you convinced that if I label each cell using this particular method, then I can eventually find a way to map every single coordinate, which is a two tuple in this case, to a particular natural number? Okay, so I think most of you can see that, oh, okay, this will work. Does this also work when the axes are infinitely long? In other words, this axis goes stretches out to infinity, this axis also stretches out to infinity. Yeah, because if we just keep painting in a diagonal way, so no matter where we are, okay, you know, in terms of the filling, we always find a way to fill, you know, diagonally like this way, and then go to the next diagonal, go to the next diagonal, and so on. All right, next question. 
is this function by ejection. So I'm not going to go for the mathematical proof, okay? Just intuitively, is it a bijection? First question, can, if I number each cell this way, do you think two cells may end up with the same number? No, because we only use a number once and only once, right? So that means it is injective because I cannot be reusing the same natural number. No two cells would share the same number. That means it is injective. Second question, is it surjective? In other words, um, if I just give you an insanely large number, like 2 million and 16, does that belong to a cell? Because eventually it will, will find it, right? Okay. So intuitively we know that that function, whatever function we are trying to propose, is going to be a bijection. Well, if this was any other, if I was anyone other than tech teaching, teaching this class, we are done with all of no, okay? But since I am tech, we are not done. <laughs> because I want to show you guys how to make that function. Yes? So you just reminded me that that is really more than tech, whether or not that's the analysis. Yes. Um, and that supposedly that proves that it's surjective. Yes. So would another way to phrase that to ask would be that every single every single point or plot has a value? It is a little different because so you know because they can have the same value. Has a value, has a unique value. Has a unique value, that is correct. Okay. Well, okay, that's it's not exactly the same either, because you can skip numbers. In other words, instead of filling these numbers as 0, 1, 2, I could have filled it as you know, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and so on. Let's so, in order for it to be subjective, we have to assume it's a function, right? In order, yes, the mapping has to be a function, but it has to use everything. Everything in the codomain must be mapped to. So that means you know, if I just give you a random natural number, you should have a way to find out which cell has that number. Is that okay? All right. So, we, but we intuitively have proven that because you know, we assign these numbers you know, by incrementing the counter. So that means you know, if I just keep doing this, I will eventually find the cell that has the number of two, 200 million and 16, or whatever number I called it a little early. Okay, so intuitively it makes sense. So that is enough already to establish one important thing, but that's it only part of what I want to express. So let me go back to, there we go. So I have basically already shown that, yes, the cardinality, the cardinality of the Cartesian product between natural number and natural number actually is the same as the cardinality of just natural number. In other words, it is all of known, okay? As as much as it doesn't seem to make sense, it works, okay? So the next thing is, okay, but can we find that, you know, find the closed form of that function, okay? So that means, you know, if I were to find, you know, function g, okay, that maps from the natural number Cartesian product with natural number, and it maps this to just natural numbers and G is a bijection what is G in other words how do we define this function well I just defined I just told you how we assign the numbers right so that means you, know, you can probably write a program to do the mapping if I give you the coordinate you just have to write the program to diagonally scan until you find that particular coordinate, and then you give me the number, the, the counter at that point. Okay? Do you think that is efficient? It's a very inefficient way of doing calculation. Okay. So that means you know, we probably would want to find a closed form to do this. So the rest of the module that I wrote is about how to derive that function. So I think we are over here. All right. I did not even know that this 
function is called Cantor's, um, there's a name for that. I just found it today. Okay, let me scroll all the way to the bottom here. Um, it is called Cantor's pairing function, okay? So when I worked on this, I did not even know the name, let alone the actual definition. So I derived everything from scratch. Now, why do you think I would want to do that? It is a question of, I know enough to make use of something as opposed to, I know something to understand how it works. So why is it important? Not only to know how something can be used, but also how that something works. And that question, even though as philosophical as it seems, is actually becoming more and more relevant in computer science. So, okay, I'm gonna let you guys think about this a little bit. This is not a philosophy class, but yet, I think it is getting more and more important. Okay, has anyone heard of the term singularity in the context of AI? So what does it mean in the context of AI or technology generally? I feel like the, uh, I feel like I have heard it, I've heard it like the point at which AI enters human intelligence or something. It gets to the point that human does not need to be a part of the process to make better technology. Okay, so in other words, you know, AI has gotten to the point where it can design the next generation of AI, the next generation of hardware to run the AI without human intervention or with very minimal human intervention. So that is called singularity. Now, why is it called singularity? I don't know, but that's what it's referring to. So we are inching closer and closer to that point, okay? We can, I can recognize that because I've been teaching this class for years, 10, you know, 15 years or so. And I can tell you that, you know, 15 years ago, there's no way, you know, the computer can, you know, look at my exam questions and figure out the answer. And I apologize for my Discord notification. Let me turn that off, okay. But it's getting closer because um, as of 2022 November, which is when ChatGPT 3.5 was first released, one of my best students asked me, is it okay for me to you know, use one of the old questions from my exams, final exams at that too, and check out you know, what ChatGPT 3.5 was able to do. So he did that and ChatGPT came back with step-by-step -step instructions, the correct derivation, and almost an entirely correct answer. And those are word problems too, okay? Those are word problems. He understood the word problem and figure out what math needs to be used to solve that problem and solved it correctly. That was two years ago. So now with version 4.0, some of the problems that it wasn't able to solve, it can now solve, okay? So I can see the progress, okay? You know, is it fast? I would say mm, it's okay, okay? It's, it, it wasn't excessively fast, but we're inching closer and closer to that direction. So there will come a point, okay, where I think, you know, the programmer or whoever is trying to get the computer to do something will know how to ask the computer to do it, but have no idea how the computer actually gets it done. The, the, so is that something that is troubling to you? Altman. Yeah. yeah. You already said you already said that a while ago. At this point they don't even know what word analysis is. Uh that's a different question. So I think what he's referring to is we don't know what the AI has learned. There's no easy way to um, ask the AI what have you learned, you know, from all the training samples. I think that's what he's referencing. But at least we know how a neural network works, right? You know, we know the math behind a neural network. We also know the uh, the math or the the design of the CUDA processor that 
NVD is putting up, putting out. So we can actually look at the transistor, the logic gates, we look at the math, we look at the programs, we eventually understand how the whole thing works, even though we don't know what the data, how the data is encoded within the weights of the neurons, okay? So that's the only part that we don't know, okay? That, I think that's what he's referencing. But there will come a time, I think, hopefully not in the near future, that the best person, the best you know, engineer, the best software person or hardware person can no longer figure out how things work. They just know how to get it to work, how to get the solution, but they don't know what you know, is inside the machine and how it gets the job done, okay? We are inching closer and closer to that time. Yes? Mm -hmm. It takes so long, right? To, at least from the current, uh, the current facility, because there's just a lot going on. You know what I mean? So to be able to write, mm -hmm. debug, and actually deploy, mm -hmm. the problem is so long because we don't even understand what the code is doing at that point. Um, there's just so many files, right? And this so is there's. A lot of so there's the amount of data that we need to process, and then there's the model that we want to extract out of the data. Yep, go ahead. Well, so with that sort of speculation on what the future is going to look like, mm -hmm. like what do you suppose will be the job domain in regarding computer science? I think, OK, so many years ago, when I was you know, in college, OK, as an undergraduate, you can graduate with a bachelor's degree or you know, at best, you know, at the most, a master's degree in computer science, and there'll be employers lined up to hire you, okay? And all you need to do is to go, like, I, I know how to do the basic programming in Pascal, okay, because C was not even popular at that time, or in COBOL. And that type of programming is what I would call tedious, okay, but not difficult, okay, because your main task is Oh, I need to write the driver to make a printer work. Okay, it is tedious, but it's not really mind-boggling you know, difficult. There's no object-oriented programming at that time, so programming was more or less mm, kind of it's kind of like a sweatshop. Okay, you know, except you know, it's, instead of physically you know doing stuff, you're just mentally doing stuff that is um, tedious. That is not the case anymore. So. Um, what I want you guys to be able to do, which to improve your chances of you know, getting a job, is to retain your ability to think and understand how things work. Not just to how to use something, but also to understand the mechanism underneath. Because you know, there are, I, I would say there are fewer and fewer people you know, who have the inclination to go that far because they don't have to. So let's go back to here, okay? You know, this is a perfect example. So how do we derive the actual closed form of that function g? That's the question. So how do you, from this, okay, how can you figure out this value is supposed to be 15? Okay, so I'll just put a 15 here. But what is the pattern that you have observed? Because programming, math, computer science, they are all about abstraction. Noticing patterns, Describe the pattern. Okay. So what is the pattern that you see here? I'll, I'll give you a clue. Okay. Only look at the first row. Look at the numbers of the first row. Can you tell me what G1 is going to be? What is going to be here? 21. Good job. Okay. So what about, okay, so I put 21 here. What about the next one? 28. Because you guys are starting to notice the pattern. The pattern is... Between these two is one. Between these two is a two, three, four, five, six, and it's gonna be seven here. It's gonna be eight over here, okay, 36, and so on, okay? That is noticing pattern, okay? So if I know how to work out all the values of row zero of the entire thing, how do I figure out a particular cell? Okay, 
So I have a way to figure out, you know, all the values of the first row, okay, row zero, okay? So then, so I can now say, oh, okay, I know how to get to the next one. It's just going to be this particular value plus the column number of this, maybe minus one. I have to take a look. Yeah, this is what? Yep, I have to do a minus one here. Okay. This is supposed to be 45 because you know, uh, between these two is a eight. Between these two is supposed to be a nine, and that's what it is. So now I can just generalize and go like, oh, well, I got a general way to figure out the rest of the entire row. But the next question is, um, I'm just going to point to a particular cell here. What is the value that go here? You go like, ah, okay, that, meh. that means I have to go find the base of this diagonal line. So I have to track down, you know, which diagonal line it belongs to. This is 66, 67, 68, 69, uh, 70. Okay. So, but that's, so let's, that's one pattern. Okay. So the, the first pattern allows me to figure out the value of row zero. Let's look at this particular sheet here and see if you guys can find me another pattern. Okay. The other pattern has to do with um, everything on the same diagonal line has something in common. Okay. So what is that one thing? Huh? Nope. Okay. Let's, let's not randomly guess. <laughs> let's, let's go actually look at a certain diagonal line. So we're going to look at this diagonal line. So what is common between these five two tuples? Exactly. So I think all three of you were about to say the, the X and the Y value, they all add up to four. Okay, so now I got everything that I need. Because if I were to switch back here and point to a particular cell like this one, the first thing I need to know is what is the coordinate of this particular cell? Okay, the coordinate of this particular cell is 0, 1. Okay, in terms of row number, it is row 3. Okay, in terms of column number, it is 6. So row three, column six, three, six is the coordinate. So now knowing that it is three, six as a coordinate, I know where to find its base. Because if we go back here, three, six, four, five, and so on, they all belong to, to the same diagonal line and it all lands here. And what do you think is the cell over here? It will be row zero, column nine, zero, nine. Right? But using this particular method, we already know, you know, how to figure out the value at that particular cell. So what cell are we referring to? J1. J1 is right here. We know the value of that cell is 45. So knowing where to find the base of the entire diagonal line, and I know how many steps I need to take to get to the cell that I'm actually inter interested in, I just have to add that much to the value at the base. Is that okay? All right. First thing first, okay, this is after all a math class. So if I were to go to a particular column, okay, so I'm going to go to a really, really far column, like over here, okay, is there a close form for me to find the value that's supposed to go here? So you guys go like, well, we can just kind of go like, you know, just keep extending this function until we get there. Well, that means I need a loop. And any time you need a loop, it is not efficient. So now the question is, is there a closed form so that I can look at a cell on the first row and say, okay, I can calculate the value of that particular cell using a closed form formula. What do you think? Okay, so let, let's check out the pattern here, okay, because I want to look at the pattern. This is 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8. Oh, looks like we're just look, looking at the summation of all the integers between 0 and the column number where the base of the diagonal line is. Is that okay? All right. So that means I am looking at something. Oh, okay. Excuse me. So we are looking at 
this, okay? So this is um, row zero, column X. And we are just looking at the summation of zero plus one plus two all the way up to X itself. But the question is, can we do this using a closed form? Well, so how do we derive the closed form equation of this? Some of you know this because you know, this is usually taught in algebra already in high school. But sometimes you, know, you just remember the equation. But how does it work? So this whole thing, this entire derivation, is showing you one way to derive the closed form equation here. Now, do you have to kind of prove you know, equations like this in this class? The answer is no. Okay, but I would like to present it just so that you can kind of follow the reasoning of why this, which is not a closed form, and this is still a not a closed form, okay, using the sigma notation, is just cheating, okay? I just have a very short way of describing a summation, but after all of these derivation, I do have a closed form. It is x times x plus one, the whole thing divided by two. Is that okay? So applying this technique to the spreadsheet, that means, uh, where's my spreadsheet, right here. So that means instead of you know, just numbering these things, I can now say, oh, by the way, this is really just the row number, okay, which is row, uh, column number, sorry. This is the column number minus one times the column number minus one, and I need parentheses. Oh, the second one you know, doesn't need the minus one because I need the plus one, but because columns start with one, I need a minus one to, for the first one, and then the whole thing divided by two. So ob observe this, okay? Because if this formula is correct, then when I do something like this, then no value displayed should have changed, okay? Because it, it should give me exactly the same value. So I'm gonna let go of my mouse button now. So it all works out, okay? I just used a closed form to compute all the values of row zero, okay? That's my first step. The second step is to look at the sum of the two tuple, okay, the two components of the two tuple, so I know which, which diagonal line it belongs to, okay? So let me give you a, an example. Let's say we want to find the value of the four, five, okay? You know, what natural number goes to four, five? Well, I already know that this is diagonal, diagonal line number nine, okay? So I have to go five steps to go here, okay? Let me explain why there are five steps. This is step one, two, three, four, five. But each step increments the counter by one. So that means whatever value is at the cell that I'm highlighting here, I just have to add five to get to the value, the natural number that is supposed to go to the four. Is that okay? So the, the closed form of the entire G function, okay, so let me go back to the actual note here. So that's why the closed form of the entire G function is, so, okay, it's back here. This is the closed form. Okay, so let's take a closer look. <coughs> XY is the coordinate, okay? X plus Y identifies which diagonal line. So that means X plus Y times X plus Y plus one, the whole thing divided by two, will give me the value of the cell at the base of that particular diagonal line. Once we have that, we know we have to take Y steps in order to get to the coordinate X, Y. So I just have to add Y to this, and that becomes the natural number corresponding to the location x1. Okay. Are we doing okay with the steps in between? At least, you know, just a general idea. Yes? Mm -hmm. Can you explain why you add y again to that one more time? Because we have to take the steps. Because we know this, is, this belongs to the same diagonal line as the value, as the cell that I want to figure out. But in order to go from here to here, it would take me five steps because I have to traverse 
the diagonal line five times to get to the set. This is step zero, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. So if I know the value of this particular cell, I just have to add five to get to the natural number that corresponds to the cell four, five. Are we good, doing okay so far? More or less? Okay. So now I'm gonna extend you know, this a little bit to give you the entire solution because I want to give you the actual value corresponding to this location. So I'm gonna get give you G of this and then close the parent again. And now we'll actually do the calculation. So the calculation is exactly what we talked about a little bit earlier. It would be the row number plus the column number. Okay, so we'll have you know, the row number oops, plus the column number. But we have to subtract two because you know, everyone is supposed to be zero oriented, but in the spreadsheet, they're all one oriented. So by adding the row number and the column number, we'll have to subtract two. And then this has to be multiplied by basically the same thing, minus one. So I'm just gonna be a little lazy, copy and paste this whole thing, and then change the minus two to minus one, because you know why do I want to do a minus two and then plus one, right? So that would do it. So this becomes the cell at the base of the diagonal line. And then I just have to add the row number you know, of the cell, okay? So I have to do a plus, oh, we have to divide it by two first, right? And then we add the row number. So there will be a row number, but since it is also one oriented instead of zero oriented, I have to do a subtraction by one. All right, so um, that's not the best format because I forgot to put the equal sign. So we stash the equal sign here. There we go. All right, so let's check out whether this works or not, okay? So we'll go ahead and just extend it this way and then extend it, doo -doo 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 -doo, including the one that we were concerned about a little bit earlier. All right. So let's check out whether this is working. I can zoom out just a little bit to see more. There we go. So this is 49, 46, 47, 48, and 49. This is 50. Okay. Well, okay. A few things we need to check. Are these values you know, to the right-hand side of the equal sign the same as what we worked out by hand? Okay, so we have zero, one, two, three, four, five. And then over here, we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. So that completes the closed form of the G function. But we know it is a bijection, right? Which means it has an inverse. <laughs> so now we have to figure out the inverse, okay? I cannot do that in two minutes, but I have done it already. So the explanation of how the inverse is derived is actually in the notes, okay? So now you have, now you have a fork in the road, which is, am I gonna read this whole thing and figure out you know, how the inverse was derived, or do I just need to know the inverse itself and know how to derive, know how to apply that? So it's the same question that I asked a little bit earlier, the philosophical question, but there's a practicality to the whole thing. If you're taking this class, 430, calculus three, and the physics that uses calculus, the answer is probably, if I have the time, I would like to do this, but since I don't have the time, I'm just gonna skip all the way to the end and understand how to apply it. On the other hand, if this, if this is your last semester, and this class and one of the GE classes are all the classes that you're taking and you have time, then I would recommend you to at least try to follow the reasoning to find out how it is derived. Because I think the value of this class and also basically all the classes that I teach is not so much what you learn in terms of the knowledge of the class, but how to think. Because that is a much harder thing 
it's a much harder topic to, for me to teach. I can teach you the material, it's easy, okay? Chat GPT can do that. But teaching how people how to think, it's harder. Which one is more important when you are applying for a job? What you know or how you think? It is always how you think, okay? Especially these days. 20 years ago, it doesn't really matter, okay? But we are not 20 years ago anymore. So unless you have a time machine that can throw you back 20 years, <laughs> uh, the answer is you want to focus on how to think, okay? All right, so I'm going to conclude this class. There's a new homework assignment, okay? So check um, the announcement for the new homework assignment. It's due next Wednesday at 3 p.m. All right, so I'll sign off. Hmm? I'm gonna post, uh, the I can post the document, yeah. Um, right, so I'm going to turn off the recorder, and I'll see you next Monday, unless you're also in my assembly language class tomorrow. Alrighty.